But this is a good episode talking about what you should do with your money. And again, this is not financial advice. Yes, we should have disclosed that at the top. Yes. Maybe maybe in the intro do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. While most people get into bourbon because they enjoy it, there is a story behind every bottle, and that captivates many of us. But then there are times we get our hands on a bottle, that certain special one, and we start thinking twice before ever opening it. The secondary market for scotch, it's been around a while, but bourbon is relatively new in comparison. And there's been an increase of rare bourbons hitting high dollars at auctions, and even more auction houses are starting to become legal. And in this episode, Ryan, Fred, and myself, we analyze the bourbon market and give our opinions on why whiskey isn't just for drinking anymore. We also gaze into our crystal ball and try to guess on some of those brands that have potential future value. And then we talk about moving on from flipping bottles to now people are starting to flip barrels. Well, with that, I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes on Twitter from Adam Nielsen, who hits me up at Fred Minnick. For someone trying bourbon for the first time, what are three bourbons you would put in their first ever tasting flight? Cheers, Adam in. Great question. Over the years, I have kind of like changed my opinion on this. When I'm doing tasting flights, I'm doing them based on education and story arc. And so this comes up all the time. People are like, why did you taste in that order versus by proof? I think tasting in the order of proof is actually pretty lazy. You know, people have a tendency to be like, oh, it's low proof, so it must not be hot. When the reality is there's a lot of 80 proof bourbons that taste more alcohol forward than a cash drink product. So I do it based on flavor profile, also story arc. Now, for a person just starting out, I mean, you're not just throwing these people into the wolves. You got to wet their palate with some story. You got to tell them some history. So while I can give you three bourbons to have this conversation with, you really need to be prepared to tell the story of little things like uh, Bottled and Bond. What is the Bottled and Bond Act? Where did it come from? Why is it important? Why is uh, weeded bourbon different than high rye bourbon? You need to be creative with your approach because the thing that gets new people into bourbon isn't necessarily always a taste. It's a lot of the story, and it's not the story, well, my great-grandpappy climbed those hills and had the yeast in his toes. It's not that kind of story. You know, it's the story, the real story of like the grains, the origin of a lot of these acts, whether President Taft, you know, defining bourbon for the very first time, or the 1964 Congressional Declaration of Bourbon being a unique product of the United States. So those things are very, very important. So I guess what I'm getting at is the arc I'm about to give you in terms of what three things you should taste are based on a story more so than flavor profile. Flavor profile, you'd probably mix them up a little bit, but they're not that far away from proof. And they're also very obtainable. I'd like you to start the story out with a bottled and bond, preferably something like Evan Williams bottled and bond, which everybody can get. Because that way you can give the person an indication of how important whiskey is to the United States of America. I mean, the Bottle and Bond Act was incredibly important in 1897 and remains to be on labels today. So that's important to tell that story. Maker's Mark would be the second bottle that I would recommend. Also, Maker's Mark is great starter bourbon. A lot of bang for your buck in that 90 proofer. It also gives you the opportunity to tell the story of bourbon's resurgence because when Maker's Mark is coming back or coming out in the 1950s, they were kind of the torchbearer of, of bourbon for a long time when bourbon was in the decline in the 1970s and 80s. They were a sexy story and, you know, for the most part, remain to be so today. And the last one that I would tell you to bring out would be like a Four Roses single barrel or a Four Roses small batch. And that allows you to give a, a tasting contrasting style between the Maker's Mark a weeded bourbon 
and a high rye bourbon so that you can show the differences between the two styles while at the same time talking about how Four Roses comes back into the picture in the early 2000s. So there you have it. You have uh, three bourbons there that you know represent a unique story arc as well as different flavor profiles. That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. If you want to be like Adam, hit me up on fredminnick.com or at Twitter. Just look for my name, Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, the memory game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky. And you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Another episode of Bourbon Pursuit coming at you. The whole gang's here today to talk about, well, I mean, money at the end of the day. It's what makes the world go around. Cash rules everything around me, cream. But, you know, when we talk about whiskey, <laughs> oh boy, there is money involved. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I didn't know Wu-Tang was getting... You didn't know Wu-Tang was going to drop with this? That's what we're talking about? The RZA, the Jizza, Old Dirty Bastard, Inspector Deck, You God, Ghostface Killer, what? Raekwon the Chef. And wow. Method Man. Method Man. I think I got most I'm, of all of them. I'm impressed. Was See, Red Man on or Red no? Man was not. No, no, he was just hanging out with They did a movie together. Wu Tang or, or Outcast? Who are you picking? Wu Tang. Oh, all the Outcast. Outcast. I like Outcast. Yeah, Outcast. So I'm picking. Well, I guess I'm Outcast on this one. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were really bad jokes. <laughs> but this is going to be an episode where we talk about whiskey as an investment. For the longest time, people have bought and purchased whiskey for being able to consume and, you know, years ago being able to do it. And, and they didn't know that they were sitting on gold mines. A lot of people that started digging through their grandma's basement ended up finding some old bottles and realizing that they're holding on to a couple thousand dollars worth of bottles now as well. Mm. And there's the new sort of generation of people that are buying barrels and flipping barrels on the open market. And there's also 
things that we've probably all seen in our Facebook feed from things like Cask X that I'm right. sure that we've seen and looked at the comments and we'll be able to speculate a little bit on that. But NFTs, that world. So oh, yeah, gosh, there's like yeah. now like timeshares of bottles where like you, uh, you know, like with a timeshare, you could stay you at get a to drink place. this week. Yeah. <laughs> Next, <laughs> Next week's mine. It's crazy. And you know what? Anytime in this world of currency, anytime something's successful, the people who like to make money find ways to capitalize on stuff. That's all it is. Yeah. So I guess the the first thing to kind of talk about is bottles. I mean, that's kind of where most people are kind of at in this journey. And it really, I guess I'll kind of put it to you all out is that I think it pains me to say it, but it's a lot of people that also feel the same way too. And they're like, oh, whiskey's made for drinking, not for collecting. And I think we all maybe had that same sentiment a few years ago, but the dynamic is it's changed. I mean, personally for me, as you start collecting things, I was originally buying them with the intention of drinking. As I accrued so much, I realized, okay, I'm sitting on at least a year's of college tuition right here. So what's the next move? I think you got more than a year's worth of time. Two, <laughs> you might have two degrees, you know, a couple <laughs> degrees and some majors. Maybe a doctorate in there. I yeah. mean, he may it may just become the new fun, you know, for the Bourbon Pursuit Fund. That's it. There's a whole new uh, venture here. How many for shares you. do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if the listeners only knew the inside joke on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I'm one of those idiots that did open all my rare and expensive bottles just because I'm so excited. I, but I do have probably a handful that I haven't opened just because they are so valuable mm -hmm. that it's not worth opening. And they're just going to appreciate because they're, you know, Stitzel Well or Old Heaven Hill, you know, just old stuff that's never, ever going to be replicated. And it's only going up in value. I mean, it's kind of plateaued a little bit, but I think it's still going to go up because there's just not enough. But I mean, yeah, there's, gosh, I mean, I think the University of Louisville did like an economic study. Like somebody did a, like a, their thesis or on their master on the, we had it on a on an episode a long time ago. Yeah. And I think like the average rate of return, like, and I think this was only like 2015 to now was like 200%, you know, if you were buying you know, whiskey and holding on to it, like your average rate of return is like 200%. That kind of return, you don't see any other investment, right. you know? And so uh, I know why people get excited about it and why they, it is exciting to find rare and old bottles and hang on to them. This is going to be a fun topic because it's pretty cool. Well, it's changed so much of like what is in demand. Like, so an investment is an investment based on if you can get a return on it, right? But there are actually bottles that are no longer commanding the prices they did 10 years ago because a few key players have gotten out of the game. A really good example is Stitzel Weller bottles. When Sean Brock was in the game and buying up those bottles, you would see those things get five to $10,000. Now that he is out of the game, you know, they're down to two, 3,000, depending on what it is. Is it just because there's nobody at that level that wants to buy them anymore? Or is it just because he valued them in such high regard that he would pay for them and now there's yeah, just I, I nobody think, has the deep pockets. So I think that the interest for like old whiskey, the people who were interested in it got it. And I think that there's not enough of it to go around to like, you have to have some of it to go around to like build an interest from a fan base. And there's so much coming out right now in the contemporary sense that the new bourbon drinkers they're five years away from getting into Dusty's, you know, or unless they have a good friend that brings them into it. But like, if you don't have the market out there, which five, 10 years ago, it was all in the legal market, right? It was all secondary, but it was still good data to pull from. But we did also have a legal secondary market with like the auction sites, like Christie's. Christie's put all the overhold from uh, Andrew Mellon's estate into the circulation. Those bottles got pulled around everywhere. I paid $10,000 for one. And just uh, recently in a charity auction, the same bottle went for 6000 Oh, wow. So the values of these older bottles are beginning to go down, while some bottles like Michter's and Whistlepig are skyrocketing. Pappy's pretty consistent, obviously. What would make you think that, why would Michter's and Whistlepig be going up in this sense. I, I, it's like a almost like a misnomer on how that would They're happen. They're northeastern brands. Uh, that's a good. Is point. that what it is? Yeah, yeah I think because yeah. you got a lot of. I mean, a lot of big money's in you know the New York, Connecticut hedge fund 
folks who really love whiskey and that I'm just speculating, but that would make sense. I, I think that's more than speculation. I think that's a really good theory. But the early Whistle Pig releases, that was really before a lot of people knew what they were. When Pickerel was. Wh- that was Pickerel's Prime and like those things. If you see a first edition of Boss Hog on the market in an auction, I mean, I saw one. I, I want to say it got $13,000 on a whiskey auctioneer auction. And then like these 20 and 25 year old Mictors they will blow a Pappy release out of the water in an auction. And I just think that- well, that's more rare. Yeah, exactly. It's And I think that's what drives it. But again, you have to have a buyer. You know, If you're going back to the bourbon consumer of 25 years ago, there's not a buyer for that. Today, Michter's has positioned themselves kind of like Dalmore has or like McAllen and Scotch with that really high-end client. Like they're on that show billions. They have found a way to get themselves- in the circles of rich people. <laughs> and that's one way to do it. That will get people interested in it. So, well, and the whiskey's fantastic, usually. Yeah. Always do. Yeah. It, it's one of those rare ones where it's not over oaked. I was thinking about this last night. We were talking about blenders and master distillers leaving this or that. And I was like, you know, Mictors has just been so consistent since they've, you know, revamped the brand. Like, yeah. they just consistently nailed it with releases, like limited to releases, you know, whereas other distilleries, you'll have a good one, but then they'll kind of be let down, this and that. Yeah. Theirs are just like no fail always, it seems to me. I'd agree with that. And then they have that, they'll have a press release out when they don't have a 10-year release or 20-year <laughs> like, release. For uh, <laughs> not this year. Not this year. And they called uh, Willie Pratt. Dr. No or something like that. That's what it was. Maybe that's what it was. They were so strict on their guidelines of what can get pushed out to market that that's why they're always deliver home runs. That's probably it. I'll throw another theory out on maybe why we're seeing maybe the bottles decrease in value and stuff like that. And that's because of just the proliferation of auction houses. I mean, if we roll back to when I started getting into it, 2014, 2013, the way that you got these bottles were through secondary Facebook groups. And mm-hmm. that's how you got your hands on these. And this was a very much more of a tight knit community. And now as bourbons exploded, the legality of being able to ship, being able to sell and auction things off at crazy different prices and all these different places. Now you start seeing not even in just in America, it's also in the United Kingdom. People are also mm-hmm. acquiring bottles and doing big bourbon and American whiskey auctions through there. So now it seems like every single week there is a new auction that's out there that's trying to break some sort of record and they all have the same exact bottles. It might be a Linnell Red Hook. It's going to be some of those old Jack Rose's Willet picks. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the whole Van Winkle lineup. And at this point, you kind of just get over flooded with too many options. And so therefore, you there's not enough buyers now with all the options that are out there that you can go. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. The amount of auction houses that are out there legally doing this has skyrocketed. Plus, you have the likes of Justin's House of Bourbon that are also selling them at retail. And, you know, the laws and everything have changed to for the better. But I think it really does come down to, like, who is the buyer? Is the buyer there? Like, the enthusiasm for vintage whiskey, I think, has waned because, like, how many times have you had a dusty bottle that just sucked? <laughs> I mean, the corks, the uh, way they're stored, like there's such a gamble. And people don't want to spend $15,000 to find out like, God, this has oxidation in it, you know? And you're the one that's tried a lot of the pre-prohibition stuff. And yeah. you said this is usually not going to be worth your money as you get exactly. into Exactly. Yeah, it's really true. I mean, you do it for an experience, but to have a little taste and piece of history. But for the most part, whiskey made prior to 1955 is is a real crapshoot even 55 to like 80 is a bit of a gamble but it's still a little a little more precise but those bottles just don't they're dropping in value because i think that the buyers are changing and you can find things don't get me wrong they're not 200 dollars. they're still five thousand seven thousand but they're not appreciating along with the scarcity the yeah, do you think it's because the secondary market's gone too? Because I, I think of people like me who used to be in that market of buying dusty bottles, sec, mm-hmm. you know, because it it was pretty easy. It was reduced well, friction. It, it, yeah, know, it was they're, easy, they're, but it was also entertaining. It was, you know, and, and it was educational for people. Whereas now I would 
there's no chance I'm going to an auction house and, yeah. you know, bidding on bottles right. and stuff. And uh, buyer's premium and yeah. you pay extra ship money, all the stuff that goes into just having to, I mean, I guess you can put on your credit card, which is nice. But after that, yeah, it's there's a lot more fees involved. We're walking into a liquor store that is able to sell them and paying all that. The secondary market, which it's pretty much gone, but how it used to be is like we would get on a Facebook group and there would be chatter about a bottle. Someone would post a bottle and then, you know, there'd be bidding in the comments and then people would go back and forth. But it was always, I love those because it was education for people. It really was more than anything. It was data and it was marketing about old brands and that's gone. And too, you had like what I loved was on those really rare bottles, they would do like a mega ball or a power and you could take a chance, you know, at like 500 bucks a spot, you know, to win a, like a really expensive bottle. And those were, okay, I'm willing to risk, you know, this, I didn't do it often. Your degenerate gambles when it comes down pretty to it. <laughs> I'd rather do that than go to the casino boat. You yeah. Know? <laughs> but uh, those were fun too. Yeah. The good old days, right? It's really interesting to see the dynamic of how this is shifting and the fact that values are going down when the amount of bourbon drinkers is on the rise. Do you think it's a like an education that maybe people don't have? Or is it because people just aren't, they're not seeing it like we used to see it? Because, I mean, I'll just take my own personal story is that when I started getting into bourbon, I had a friend that said, hey, let me add you to some of these bourbon groups. I think you're going to really enjoy it on Facebook. And then that's when I started realizing, oh my God, there's these wax tops. There's all this other stuff. There's Dusties that have a price tag for $8.99 that are selling for $200. And I was like, what in the world is going on here? Everybody's glued to social media, no matter what. So that's Ryan because he deletes his apps about once or twice a year and then he he takes a break. But for the, for the most part, People are glued to social media. And if you just see it in your feed, then you're always seeing it. Mm -hmm. If you're not looking for an auction house and you're not looking to go and buy bottles from I don't yeah. know, unicorn auctions or Christie's or whatever it is, then, you know, it's kind of like if monkey see, you know, you don't, you don't see anything, you don't do anything. It just bypasses you all together. Well, yeah. And I think the new bourbon consumer, they're so enamored with whatever Sazerac's putting out. And, <laughs> it's true. And, yeah. Trying to you know, chase Eagle Rare. And even if you look at the auctions, that's a great point. The Buffalo Trace stuff commands. The contemporary bottles, like I would say things made from 2000 to date, that is what's driving the market. A Four Roses limited edition small batch from 2008 will most likely bring something more than uh, like a, a Thomas Moore from 1968. You Very know? true. That is what we have seen is that the effect of what's on the shelf today is commanding the what people want out there. So that Buffalo Trace effect is pretty powerful. Do you think it's an education thing though? As maybe people that are getting into bourbon, they just don't know. They just don't know what dusty bourbon's like. They don't know what these well old I, unicorns of why they're called unicorns. The, I love dusty bourbons. That's probably my favorite, but they're not sexy bottles. They're not cool. And I think yeah. that's what they're missing, you know, from somebody who has a collection they're wanting to show off, you know, like a Michter's bottle, sexy, mm -hmm. it's cool. A Willet bottle's got the purple foil with the crest, uh, you know, the pappies and the they're all those big like wine bottles that, oh, I can show these trophies off. Whereas dusty bottles are they're cool to have, but they're not like bougie. Yeah. If you bring someone in your bar and you've got an old crow chess piece, someone's looking at that and like, oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. You know? I mean, you <laughs> have to looks be like my grandma's base. Yeah. yeah, yeah you, have to be, you have to be into the category like deeply to appreciate that or like an old Van Winkle decanter or here's a crazy one. This is the moment where I realized how effed up things were in this sphere. It was at the Kentucky Derby Museum. Julian Van Winkle was our guest. You know, you can go back and listen to that episode here. We have that, right? I think we do. Yeah. It's somewhere in the archives. It's in there. But Julian brought two things to auction off to raise money for the, the Derby Museum. The place is packed. And there's a lot of youth in the crowd, like the wealthy 28 to 40-year-olds who flew in from all over for this experience because we, we, we busted out the nines. It was the, one of the best tasting experiences I've ever put on. He brought one of the last bottlings of when his family owned Sitzel Weller, 1972, his bottle in 1972. And he put it hand to God. He was just like, if you win this, it will be the best whiskey you've ever tasted in your life. He's like, this is, you know, he talked about it and how special it was to his family. He brought that bottle to auction 
And then he had the uh, a ten year old rip modern with that real sexy label, and you put the two bottles together, you got like a squatty looking, you know, screw cap looking thing that was just kind of meh. Yeah, then you got the wizard, and then you have the wizard, and bro dudes bid up the wizard to I want to say five six grand or something like that. Holy smoke! And the nineteen seventy two Stitzel Weller went for two k. It was like, I was just like, <laughs> what the fuck God. is wrong with you people? <laughs> but I probably got the numbers wrong, but it was like kind of uh, disproportionate. It's so crazy. That was the first time I realized how much packaging and, and like a modern look can feel, you know. Yeah. And they just wanted that, probably just wanted that bougie basement look like you were saying. Yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. So I guess the moral of the story is just keep collecting Blanton's letters. That's right. And that's going to be your ticket to having some sort of investment. That's probably a legit thing to say but it's hard to know what to hang on to because like i had a tornado eh taylor i paid 75 bucks for it i thought it was okay but i mean how in the hell is it worth 10 12 thousand dollars now yeah. you know cured oaks i thought well, they were great but how the hell you know i opened and drank them and it's like yeah how same. do you know like it's hard to predict what's gonna be valuable to someone later on down the line and i guess Especially now, it's like, okay, what are we drinking now that we could see being valuable, you know, in the future? And how do you determine which LTO or limited time know, offering? So is, there's, I mean, there's there's a new one every week now. I mean, we all get the press releases. So yeah. it's hard to determine what it is. It's either got to come from probably most likely a heritage distillery, and it's got to have some big age statement on it because that's usually the only ones that are going to... There's a little bit of uh, the source brands right now, I think could be a good buy, a good investment to like have down the road. If Whistle Pig is a good example of a brand that was really sexy to a small crowd and they grew out and they capitalize on the their location, you know, you got to look at like what's a brand that kind of meets that same pedigree and Smoke Wagon is a really good one. You can go into pretty much any store right now where they are and you can find Smoke Wagon for about 40 bucks, like a regular small batch Smoke Wagon. In... 20 years with the way that brand is going, those things could be 500 bucks, you know, for all I know. But some of their like rare and limited and special, now special there specials, goes all the smoke wagons, you know. <laughs> I mean, but, but I, th- I don't think, I think that's they're all going that way anyway. No, I know. I mean, their bottles are going between six and 10,000, like their special bottles at like a charity auction. So you have a brand there that I think is really good. I think you also have to look for some of the blends of straights things that nancy fraley has done you know nancy mm-hmm. fraley yeah, is some like of those old magnuses or special. yeah so if you take a look at like who created them going back to that pedigree of like what whistle pig did who's the closest thing to dave pickerel and i think nancy fraley fits that bill pretty well with like what she has put out there's a lot of that one of the brands that has been shocking to me too is like how good they are a barrel barrel does so well in competitions and everything and they have a little a pretty interesting fan base. I think that's one that could also be like an investment brand, like especially if you collect all the batches, there's going to be some batches like Batch 11, which won San Francisco. I think Batch 33 from this year is in that same kind of league. Some of those batches could be like really incredible investments for down the line because they're, they do well. First release is Seagrass, you know, (laughs) your your number two. Yeah, Yeah, Seagrass would be, would be up there. I mean, even for for the modern brands, back to what Ryan was saying, it's really hard to kind of know what are you going to go ahead and put your investment in. Well, a, you've got to have the the self control to not open it and drink it. So that's the first part. But if you are going to go and you know buy the the latest edition of barrel, or you're going to go and buy the smoke wagon batch one sixty two, who knows if any of that it will be worth anything come three four years later. I think it will probably have to be some pivotal moment where that brand really explodes or something has changes to, something has to change where it you know rises to a a buffalo trace esque type level right yeah. that's the only way that i feel that it's going to happen it's going to be hard for a lot of brands to be able to do that i understand what you're saying about smoke wagon because of aaron and the bottle but i mean really it's five and seven year mgp and there's a plethora of them out there it's like so unless like for some reason that five to seven 36% ride is no longer being pushed out there. I just, I don't know. Well, he, he's a little different. Like he's actually distilling at MGP, like their contract distilling for him. So he's a little different. 
but a lot of that's also he can't distill there by the laws of Las Vegas. So it's probably better for him to have distilled an MGP anyway. But almost all of this is has way more to do with branding than the quality of the way. I hate to put it that way, but it's and true. it's great whiskey. Don't get me wrong. God, but branding smoke like smoke I've drank's been good. True, but just in general, like in spirits, you know, any kind of luxury good, like they always say, like. It's marketing and branding is so important. That's why I've been looking at your shelf, Kenny. There's one bottle that I probably would not say that I would personally pick this, but I can see it being one of those brands that pops because of its branding of the label, the bottle, the butterfly on it, and that's Blue Run. I can see Blue Run hitting the right audience at the right time. Especially if you got some of those 13, 14 year olds. Yeah. You know, no, I like mean, that's never opened. It's <laughs> kind of what made their name, right? That's how they made their splash. They, you know, they come out with the 13, 14 year and then. And you have the Jim Rutledge juice, you know, mm-hmm. that I could see that. That's a good point. That's a great bottle that stands out. And that's one I can see. Well, too, they in, I did that. now it's Blue Run and Smoke Wagon could be because they are, you know, West Coast brands. You know, they have all that. Just as I was saying with Whistlepig and Michter's being Northeast brands, you know, right. being that close to California and all the West Coast, you know, there's a ton of money out there that I could, it all would make sense as well. We're uh, re- reliving uh, 90s hip hop here with uh, <laughs> East, <laughs> East Coast, West Coast. East Coast, West Coast. <laughs> Insert California love. The other one I would, honestly, I'd like to see, for me, I look at bottles and investment and where I'd put my money and I would look at it as something that cannot or will never kind of be reproduced ever again. And the one that kind of comes to mind only because I took a glance over my shelf was when you took a thing that's like Booker's Rye. Like that was a one-time yeah. sort of thing that Booker No laid down. It was a ton of bottles. They sold it for a very premium at the time, which was $300 a bottle. And a lot of people kind of shied away from it until it won Jim Murray's Whiskey of the Year. That, and that ours, is, that, that is, Whiskey was, Advocate at the time. Okay, yeah. and that too. It's a right? very rare moment where yeah. we were all on the same page, Whiskey of the Year. But yeah. I mean, I look at that as something that that should hold its value over time. Because yeah, it, you would it, think, but Booker's, I guess because there's just so many of them out there, batches, they probably get lost in the translation of like, what's this bad? What's different? You know, I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of. But I don't know. What do you think for it? Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. That should hold its value over time. Because yeah, it, you would it, think, but Booker's, I guess because there's just so many of them, <laughs> out there batches they probably get lost in the translation of like what's this bad what's different you know i don't know that's the only thing i could think of but i don't know what do you think for it i'm sure even new listeners are so, listening to this going i've never even heard of booker's rye before yeah so yeah. booker's rye is actually obtainable and it doesn't draw like the kind of money that you think it would well, even like uh, booker's 25th is one of my favorite yeah of all time and it doesn't it, but, yeah i don't know why it doesn't that escapes me, like why? But the ryes that crush it out there are usually Willets. Yeah, those old but ones. Rye is not a on the auctions. Like the data on that is like obscure. I don't understand it. Some of the greatest ryes, like the Redemption rise between like two thousand eight and two thousand twelve. I mean, he was getting pick of the litter 
And that's the best MGP rye those, ever. The Rittenhouse ryes, too, those older ones. Oh, that yeah. Were, those are oh, like those, those single, bo- those single barrels. Magical. Yeah, those... I don't think those are up for resale because everyone drank them all, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, they were so affordable. I think they, they were, were so- like seventy bucks, or maybe not even that much. Yeah. Whenever I bought those way back in the day, but another one that I think's crazy too is King of Kentucky. You know, I donated one last year to mm-hmm. the tornado, and I thought it would bring a lot more, but I think it only brought you know a little over a thousand dollars, and it's like that's some double digit eight. I think the one I gave was like. 13 or 14 years old, but I mean, that bottle's sexy. It's cool. It's historic. It's like it's a rare, great it's, whiskey. It's one know? of the more rare of the rare ones because yeah. they are single barrel offerings. There's what, less than nine cases, 12 cases that come out of every single barrel. It's usually only released in mostly just Kentucky or another state. And it's super, super hard to come by versus something like a 23 year Van Winkle that I'm not going to say it's easily accessible, but there's a lot more that comes out every single year. Yeah. Yeah, King of Kentucky is, I think that one is is a little puzzling as well because the whiskey is so amazing. But I think it's that's a product of being insulated to the niche of the niche of the whiskey community. And it hasn't broken out into like anybody really knowing about it outside of us. What about Where, birthday bourbon then? Well, birthday bourbon is like that has broken out. Like that has everybody in the niche interested in it. Whereas like because of the bottle shape, is it, it's one? it's a little bit of the bottle shape and it's, you know, historically done pretty well. And, and in the name, yeah, birthday bourbon, like, you know, it's it's unique. It's my birthday, man. <laughs> you know? Also, I want a Blanton's with my, my with dump my, date. Yeah. My, yeah. Dump date. Yeah. my kid's born this year. I want a birthday bourbon <laughs> to hang on to. I'm like, they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> They'll want to sell it when it becomes when they take exactly. that one anyway. Yeah. That's what exactly because I am definitely one of those people that got myself a 2013 birthday bourbon for that same exact reason. When the time comes around, I'm sure she'll be like, yeah. I'd rather just sell it and keep the money. Well, good and year. Some of the Parker, I still think the Parkers, even you know the early ones, are still not crazy. Like those 27 years are. I mean, the most I've ever seen them go for is like 2,500 to three grand. Yeah. I mean, and those are like mind blowing good. Blended mash bills is probably one of my favorite. Of all times. And yeah. you could get that for sub thousand dollars all day. Yeah, it's interesting. Like those uh Parkers is a brand that doesn't get the respect. And I think it, a lot of it goes back to packaging. It doesn't turn a lot of people on. It's a nice bottle. Same with King Kentucky. It's a nice bottle. I think you just gotta be in a cognac bottle or a wine bottle. Maybe well, that's what it that is. seems to be the common theme here. It's true, but the old fits decanter. It's starting to knock on the door of like a really good, uh, sexy, appealing The bottle. last 17-year-old was amazing. I can crush that bottle. So good. We'll kind of move on to the next topic here. But from the way that I kind of see it is that if you're able to get a bottle at a retail and it's a limited time offering, if you want to open it and drink it, by all means, if you want to hang on to it, you'll probably get a little bit of appreciation and value over it. We'll have to kind of see and revisit this in a few years and figure out exactly yeah. what is the modern LTOs and how they kind of transformed is Dusty's coming. Are they going to be coming back or any kind of those other epic Willet bottlings or anything like that? If Linnell's Red Hook is still pulling, you know, 24, $30,000 a bottle kind of thing. But when you think about it, the here and now, like uh, how many Facebook groups do we go into and someone takes a picture and it's like, it's Calumet farm 16 year worth $150. And if you look around the market of like what else is available at 16 years and you look at something as an investment, that is one where I'm like, buy every bottle if you're like thinking of it as like an investment for down the road. But, you know, of course, I think of it about like drinking it. Like I don't hang on to them. I probably should. I mean, I do hang on to some bottles, but but I really don't. I, I open them and I share them. So do you guys. I mean, we're, we share. But anything that you see that is behind the glass case and is a reasonable value double if, digits if things case statement yeah if things continue where that's going to appreciate and if you can get something like Henry McKenna at SRP or Blanton's at SRP that's going to appreciate I mean now you could you know not saying you should but that would appreciate the minute you walked out the door so yeah. Pretty much. That's the world we are in for bottles. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But there's also another world and that's the world of barrels. Mm-hmm. And there's a, a new breed of people that are getting into it. And most of these people are the ones that have probably been into bourbon or been into whiskey for a little bit. And they've kind of seen the, as Ryan had hinted to earlier, is kind of the trajectory of the rate of return that you're getting on bottles. And 
now that we have seen really, I think this is kind of like a new problem or a new investment that we've seen only because if we go back five, 10 years ago, I don't know if a lot of people were buying barrels just to go and flip them. And the reason that you're seeing it nowadays is because there is a shortage of whiskey barrels on the open market from non-distilling producers and people that want to go and create their own bourbon and kind of capitalize on this boom that's happening. Mm -hmm. And so there are people that are now going to Bart's and Bourbon Company. They're going to MGP or used to be able to go to those places. And now there's a huge waiting line because you can't get in because there's other people already there to do exactly what we're talking about. By the way, you have to have some some deep pockets to kind of start getting into this. It's You're looking at hundreds of thousands to- well, you're not gonna million. get into it right now because there's waiting lists, but yeah. <laughs> maybe in three years. Yeah, but even if we go back three years, you're still you know a couple hundred thousand dollars oh, yeah. to take you to even get started in this. Yeah, and I think the person that made this all possible was Brindiamo, you know, that really was very smart and ahead of the game, just thinking like, okay, these are appreciating assets to have value. Let's offer this as an investment vehicle for folks who don't want to have a brand. They like whiskey, but they don't want to go through the shenanigans of having a brand that had money to invest. And he was very brilliant in packaging this as an investment vehicle for folks. And that's just really skyrocketed, you know, how much production is being done at these um, contract distillers. Yeah. Well, there's uh, all kinds of programs out there where you can uh, invest in a barrel, you know, to capitalize on that. And I remember five years ago, you started to see this and it was at these companies, individuals will make their own investments. And I remember a lot of people were buying new make from um, MGP. You know, they were an importer, but like they're them as individual bought 5,000 barrels of MGP and they would start selling them. They would never leave. They just owned the warehouse receipts, you know, so they would never leave the warehouse. And so they would just, you know, put them out there on the market or sell them back to MGP. It was just like the writing was on the wall for this to be a move to make. The difference between now and five, 25 years ago is that now it's chasing consumers, people out on the street who are not in the industry. There's a lot of groups out there and you got to do your homework because. Yeah, just another back history piece of this whole too heaven hill and barton helped give a lot so they would pre-sell their you know allocation to distributors Mm -hmm. the distributors would buy barrels that new make cost so they could lock in their prices at four years when they bought you know how many xyz cases of evan williams or elijah craig they bought it at new make prices and held on to it but then you know they would be like well i bought all this but i'm not really necessarily selling through all these cases, how about instead of bottling this, I'm going to put this on a bulk market, you know, and start seeing if I can get cash that way as well, instead of going through all the the bottling, paying excess tax and whatnot. And so that was to really start getting, you know, a lot of excess Heaven Hill juice and bar juice into the, you know, the brokerage market and whatnot. And then as prices kept going up, you know, investors were like, well, we can do this at contract distilling places as well. Anyway, I just, no, that interesting. That's, that's true. Well, one thing to add to that, the European market too would buy and bulk a lot of um, bourbon. They would keep it and then trickle it back in the market from time to time. And you still see that. One of my favorite stories about Heaven Hill and their brokerage days, like this one guy got the rights to use like Heaven Hill and they like hate him because he like he resells something every year and you can still see like this like group that gets that can have the rights to use like Heaven Hill as like an independent bottle thing. Is it the Cadenhead? Is that who it is over there that can do that? So there's a broker who bought this and he parcels it out. The strategies in Europe are very different than here. And they played a big, big, big role on that business. And it was like when Bourbon was not doing well, they were there with with money. This has always been a part of the game. Brown Foreman would sell barrels to Jim Beam, you know, once upon a time. So they, at the time, these companies were making so much money on white spirits. They didn't really need the money for, but they're like, if we could just get, you know, a little bit over what we're to manufacture, they're like, that's a win in our game. That they, they had no idea that the boom was coming, you know, 10 years down the road. That's um, right. And for us, we're not flipping our barrels, but... When we were getting yeah. into this game, and, <laughs> there you go. As as we, I know sometimes you look at what 
barrel prices on, you're like, we should just flip it and get out of this show. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and close up shop. Yeah. I'll give you all uh, Kenny's number later. <laughs> so, But when we started getting this and we try to figure out, okay, let's start raising money. Let's start buying barrels. Let's start doing this to start building our brand for future longevity. One of the key people that really helped us in, in getting this started, you know, she told us, she goes, you're never going to sell a barrel for less than you paid for it. Yeah. So if you're worried about getting into this, just know that you kind of are financially protected because it's very odd that anybody would actually have to pay less than what you paid for the barrel. So that gives you a little bit of an idea that as an investment into a barrel, it actually is a pretty damn good investment. It's not like the stock market. You don't have to worry about the company tanking. There is insurance on it. So if something happens to it, you're covered by insurance. So just from that part of a of where you're going to place your money as a liquid asset, no pun intended, there is that opportunity to be able to do that. So it does make sense for a lot of people. Yeah. And there's a big gap in the initial investment cost of the barrel and what they're valued at four to five years. Even if, say, prices come down, you'd have to drop significantly to the prices that you're paying for new make now would be what somebody paid for four to five year old 10 years ago. So prices would have to drop drastically for you to lose money. And I just don't see that happening. They might steady off, but I just don't see them falling below a thousand dollars for a four to five year old product. So that kind of leads me into the next phase of this is, is starting to look at things like cask X and other groups that are trying to do this. Now, I don't know everything about cask X. The only thing I know is what I could read on their website and what I saw in comments of people that are actually investors and what they said. And this is, they say you have to be an accredited investor to be able to do it. The minimum investment starts at $50,000 to be able to do it, which in hindsight is not too bad. That's typically like 50 barrels. And the one thing that I would say is that if you're going down this path, that if you're going to start investing in barrels, you need to know exactly where the barrels are coming from. Mm -hmm. because if it's MGP, okay, cool. There's going to be plenty of MGP. You've just got to hope in the next few years that people are still going crazy after MGP like they are now. I have a theory that says once all this Kentucky stuff comes online from Wilderness Trail, from Barstown Bourbon Company, from the other people that are in the game that are creating all this source Kentucky product, once that comes online, are people going to be chasing after MGP as much as they are now? I don't know. And so if you're banking on MGP, that might be a tough sell. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is if you are buying from, you know, you're investing into barrels from a craft distillery that nobody's ever heard of before. We have the opportunity to actually look and we see the price list that come from brokers and they know exactly what the source is and they list the mash bills. They might not tell you the source, but you can kind of figure it out pretty quickly. And there is a drastic price difference when you know the mash bill, and you know the source from one distillery versus the other. So if you think that you're going to go ahead and invest 50000 a day, and that's 50 barrels at $1,000 a piece, and you think those are going to be worth $4,000 here in four years, you might be kind of upset when you know that they're only going to be worth about maybe 2500 to 3000 because it's the distillery that you went with. Yeah. And unless Asia and India just get into this and blow this thing wide open. That's happening. And I, I know. It's, yeah, China's about... Uh, I was really I was talking to someone there. at Heaven Hill, you know, they plan on that thing dumping like 250,000 barrels next year, and that's 90% going to the U.S., and so you're like, holy shit. And then if India, one out of 10 scotch drinkers flips, then it wipes out every inventory in the U.S. But yes, to your point, yes, you need to know the source because there is different valuations on what distillery it's coming from, and KY is obviously still holding the leader in value, even over MGP, you know, by substantial amount. And so you, you definitely want to know where your barrels are being made and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of things that could dissect there and just know when you're getting into this to know the questions to ask. If you're just looking to spend money to put it in places, then you might not be having the, it's, that's dumb money, not smart money. I guess yeah. we, we've heard that I, before. Yeah. I guess with investing in barrels now, one of two things have to happen. Either Asia or India blows up or Europe. I guess that's two things. <laughs> and bourbon blows up and all the existing brands just can't. Because a lot of source brands are already contract stealing their own stuff right now. They're already laying new make. Or you think that there's going to be another surge of brands that come and buy up and try to 
you know, create their own brand. And I just don't see if, I don't know if there's enough more room for more brands to get into this sort of space. I'm not sure. What do you think, Fred? Well, I mean. Running low on shelf space, is that what you're trying to think of? I, 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 I gotta say, like, I thought the tariffs were gonna really hurt bourbon. I thought COVID was gonna really hurt bourbon. And I turned out to be, it hurt some companies, like Jack Daniels took a big hit and small brands like Catoctin Creek were very public about how they lost, you know, markets like Poland. But for the most part, things grew domestically. And I just think that if things continue, there's still enough consumers being born every second in this space. We tend to have like the glut in this, in the history of bourbon and this has potential to be what causes the glut. This f- flows into here, but the investment uh, barrels. Yeah, that's a very real potential. But at the same time, man, all these consumers are becoming spirits consumers. Like, I would be more concerned if I was a beer manufacturer than if I was a whiskey manufacturer right now. Like, I think the drinker of the future is high quality bourbon, high quality tequila, all the shit beer, all the crappy vodka. All that stuff is is getting pushed off to the side because this new generation they smoke weed and want to want to taste something good. They don't want to fuck around with shitty whiskey. We can only hope that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I like your hypothesis. Let's see if it comes true here. You know, guys, I think this is a great yeah. As with any investment, there's always a risk, and who knows? But I mean, I thought five years ago things would be peaking and. They haven't slowed down one yeah, bit at I know. all. It's, People it's, always want the, they want the bubble to burst, but it's not happening. But it's not, I would say like, there's always risk, but this isn't a faith thing. So like, you know, it's not like you're jumping into a pyramid scheme or you're investing with one of these fraudulent people wanted by the FBI now for defrauding uh, crypto investors. You know, you're looking to put money in something that is stable, but you need to understand it. Like I invest heavily in something I used to cover like restaurant equipment. Like I understand the restaurant world and I know what's working and drive throughs and all that. So I invest in technology companies that service quick service restaurants. I do really well at that because I know that space. Now I do not invest in trucking manufacturing or automobiles because I don't know jack shit about that industry. I can't even change my own oil. I mean, I can, but I don't think, you know, I think you have to have like five computers for today's uh, <laughs> That's true. oil change, but you know, my point is, is like, this is an area. You don't want to go in space blindly. Yeah, yeah. Don't go in blindly, but this is not the kind of like investment that is Amway. And it has to be one you have to be comfortable with just basically, as with any investment, setting and forgetting it. You know, it can't be something you're like, hey, what's going on? You know, if you invest now, you don't really want to check in back on it for another four or five years. Yeah. You know? <laughs> By the way, this is the bourbon world. You annoy the uh, person you bought it from, they're going to give you your shares back and say, get the hell out of here. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. No, you do not want to taste your whiskey at a year and a half. Just trust me on it. But I mean, as you said earlier, Fred, you know, you had 20 to 40 year olds flying in to do a tasting event with, you know, Mr. Van Winkle. And um, that demographic is one that's growing bourbon and they typically don't switch categories. And all the research we've done is... Once somebody's in a category, they typically don't switch. And so they might try other things. So conservatively, you know, we probably have another 30 to 40 years of, you know, stable growth, I think, in the, the whiskey space. At the very least, 18, 20. Yeah. I think that's right. The things that really have the most impact on us are like a lot of the health legislation that comes up, a lot of the advertising bans. Social media, I think, is very crucial to the growth of bourbon. And you're starting to see like these tech companies like change the algorithm where they keep alcohol out of certain things. So those are some things to keep your eye on. But at the end of the day, in recessions, there are two types of uh, industries that do really well, entertainment and alcohol. So investing in alcohol is always a solid play. People want to drink. Yeah. And we didn't even touch NFTs, but we'll have to save that for another episode. Yeah, we've done a whole episode on this. Yeah, we have. And and right now we know NFTs are kind of in the tank. Do you get excited about Well, they're kind of in the tank. I I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's something to be said about them, but that was also during the height of a year or two ago when people were only talking about them. And it seems like it died off pretty quickly. Now there's not as much kind of hype around it. There's the only people that are hyping it up are 
the ones that are trying to save their own skin in the game. Yeah. I got kicks out of this when you find out the celebrities actually are the ones who bought their own NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I was like, that didn't make any sense. Uh, burned again. Burned yeah. again. But this is a good episode talking about what you should do with your money. And again, this is not financial advice. Yes. We should have disclosed that at the top. Yes. Maybe maybe in the intro do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's like a law thing. Get but, Brian Hara. Uh, yeah, where's Brian when, when we need him? <laughs> exactly. We need our, our pre-roll with him. But make sure you follow us, Bourbon Pursuit, wherever you get your socials. If you like the show, share it with a friend. Tell a friend, hey, we're thinking about investing in some barrels. You, go, ah, you should probably listen to this episode real quick. Make sure you do that. Then they'll be a smarter bourbon education consumer as well. Mm-hmm. But with that, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. Vodka sucks. Toodles. <laughs>